What's up, gangsters? And, well, let's take a look at, you know, some more disturbing movies. I mean, that's that's what we do over here, right? Like I said at the end of the, the previous video, we'll be taking a little trip around the world. So, you know, it's, it's all foreign movies. Now, of course, um, foreign movies is a very um, America-centric definition, like a term. Basically, all movies that I watch are foreign movies to me. So, um, let's say that unless you're from Greece, Romania, Denmark, Australia, or Korea, I'm gonna take a look at some foreign movies. Mm. And, well, let's just go down that list and start in, in Greece with a little movie called Miss Violence. And, no, that's not some kind of weird, twisted beauty pageant. Mm. Yeah, um, uh, let, let's take a look at what it is. What? Yes, we're, we brought back again the, the X Minutes Later segment. Really mostly just because I want to show off some of my like favorite recent hip-hop beats, but um... Ooh, whoa, that was, that was crazy! Ooh. Hooray! There's a celebration at this Greek family. We have mom, dad, two daughters and three grandchildren. At least I believe that's the family dynamics. Being confused might be part of the story, however. Anyway, yay, it's Angeliki's 11th birthday. She doesn't look too excited though, now does she? I wonder why dad... wait, what's going on here? Oh shit! Yeah, we're barely three minutes in and we just witnessed this young girl committing suicide. The remainder of the movie then mostly focuses on how this affects the family on a day-to-day -day basis. Speaking of the family, there seems to be this, this rather uncomfortable atmosphere continuously present in the household. And not just because the girl killed herself. It, it, it's weird. At some point, the oldest daughter, who we find out early on is pregnant, she has a friend over and it's all so awkward. It feels somewhat obvious to blame the grandfather, Greek Donald Pleasance, as he runs a very strict household. He takes out the door of 14-year-old Myrto, not allowing her any privacy, and when he finds out that his grandson is not doing all that well in school, he has his sister slapping him around. Not cool. Obvious red flags, and throughout you, you feel like something is just not right, even more so than, you know, those two examples. And well, with this movie being covered as part of this series, I'm sure you can make an educated guess as to what's really going on here. Skip to here in order to avoid spoilers, you know, if you want to experience this movie to the fullest yourself. Because, well, it took us over an hour to get here, but it's revealed that the grandfather rapes his daughters as well as prostituting them. Yeah, it, it goes there. It's, it's one of those movies. That's why the girl killed herself at the beginning, because Mirto told her that the abuse starts at age 11. That's fucked up. But we're not even there yet, because in the tradition of well made, I guess, or at the very least effective misery porn, we later get some strong insinuations that the threshold of 11 years is being significantly dropped. Ugh, I, I hate how this man is looking at her. Again, I said this during No Child of Mine in the previous video, how are there always so many fucking pedophiles? Maybe I just think too highly of people in general. Anyway, yeah, what else is there to fucking say about this one? I've seen it twice now, I, I guess I would rate it a 3 out of 5. It's not bad, it's it's well made, with this minimalism style that I quite appreciate, but it's, it's also somewhat boring at times, really not that much happens. Mostly feels like it was purely made for shock value, and ultimately perhaps a little pointless, as I never felt the need to really bother reading into it some more to see if it actually had anything else to say. Yeah, I've seen a lot of people do this. I mean, it's it's easy to compare this one to the early works of Yorgos Lanthimos, specifically Dogtooth, a movie that we've also covered as, as part of this series. And I, I'm not all that familiar with uh, with the history of, of Greek cinema, like like s s movie trends over there. But from what I understand, like Dogtooth was a a pretty big deal at the time, so it is understandable if it served as an influence for this movie. And you know that's that's fine. So yeah, if you want to have your day ruined, check it out. Um, next up, what was next? Oh yeah, um, Romania. Well, um, probably the best known example of the Romanian new wave. Of course, it's four months, three weeks and two days. Also known as 145 days. 
Yeah, I'm gonna, uh, gonna stop with the lame jokes now. Let's just have a, a look at this movie. Yeah, because, well, there was nothing to joke about. It's 1987, great year. Um, maybe not so much for Romania, as it was under a communist regime during that period. We follow these two girls in a college dorm room, seemingly getting ready to leave somewhere. Um, well, I, I could get all long-winded and elaborate about it, but basically they're getting ready for this one girl, Gavita, to have an abortion. Which isn't a spoiler, it's literally the premise of the movie. And abortions were highly illegal at the time. In fact, under this Decree 770, Romanian women were highly encouraged to have children, with the communist regime going as far as making contraceptives illegal as well. All with the aim of repopulating the Romanian people. Obviously this movie, without directly addressing any of it, has a lot to say about this communist regime at the time. So, Please forgive me if I haven't caught all of this, since, you know, I'm, I'm far from an expert on the subject matter. Anyway, back to the movie. The absolute show-stealing scene in this movie, for me at least, is the one where they meet up in the hotel with the man who'll be performing the abortion. The tension is borderline unbearable, but it's also discreetly done, if that's the right word. See, um, leading up to them meeting up in the hotel, more or less Everything goes wrong. The wrong girl went up to approach him, they booked the wrong hotel, the girl forgot to bring some stuff, and on top of all of that, she lied about certain things, including how far she is in her pregnancy, and the guy is just not having it. This scene is so fucking good. It's it's so uncomfortable. It's a little over half an hour from the moment the man arrives at the hotel until he leaves, and it, it's just these three characters in a room, mostly just talking, and it's it's just so nerve-wracking. Vlad Ivonov as the man, he's so good. Like he's in total control, and every mistake the girls make, it's it's like. You know that feeling of being scolded and you just have to take it, but then it involves a freaking illegal abortion? That feeling is conveyed so well. And it goes a lot further than that, this scene, but I don't want to give away everything. But really, it's, it's a really good movie, regardless of this disturbing movie's context. All of that is just 30 minutes out of the total close to two hours running time, so Obviously, more stuff happens. The scene where, after the abortion, the friend has to make a quick appearance at the boyfriend's mother's birthday party. <laughs> oh man, did you get some kind of award for most realistically awkward, uncomfortable, meeting the parents for the first time scenario? Really, and it, it, it just goes on and on and... Oh, poor girl. So yeah, in my opinion it's not so much disturbing as it is sad, and obviously the, the historical, you know, like the, the political backdrop is highly relevant. The more you know about it, the more details you notice, but even with just understanding the fact that abortions were illegal, it works really well. Yeah, fantastic movie. Quite minimalistic in style, which I like. You know, like there's no no music. Mostly just get a, a bunch of like long, like like medium takes. Very realistic dialogue and, and performances. Honestly, if you haven't seen this one, it's I highly recommend it. It's it's really good. Uh, obviously, it's a a topic that could be highly politicized, but I don't know. I feel like the director went about it rather respectfully. So um, let us do the same and I think the best way to go about that is to just move on to the next title. Yes, um, we're moving on to Denmark where we'll be throwing all our morals and values out of the window while taking a look at the grindhouse exploitation classic, um, the sinful dwarf. <laughs> yeah, honestly, we, we couldn't get further away from the hard-hitting social realism that we got in the previous movie if we tried, but I don't know, nothing wrong with keeping things a, a little diverse. Well, um, the sinful dwarf, let's have a look at that. Yeah, yeah that, that was not classy at all. No, it was not. But what better way to shake things up than with some 70s grindhouse exploitation? I mean, just the title alone, the sin... Wait, here we get the on-screen title of simply The Dwarf. Okay, sure. But don't worry guys, this dwarf is full of sins. He runs a boarding house, I guess you could call it, together with his mother. But 
mostly as a front to lure young women in, get them hooked on heroin, and then profit off of prostituting them. In other words, just your average day in the world of 70s grindhouse cinema. And just to be clear, we're taking a look here at the strong international version as opposed to the alternate US release version. Biggest difference is that this version contains scenes of actual hardcore sex. Because that's what you want to see when a girl gets raped, I guess was what they were thinking. Anywho, as dark as all of this sounds, and if this was played straight and you know made in a similar fashion to the previous two movies, it would have been some extreme hard-hitting stuff. But it's not. It's borderline a dark comedy. It, it, it's just so over the top. Torben Bille, the little person that plays Olaf the Dwarf, I get it as not PC, but you know, it's, it's in the title. He's comically evil. His mother is a former showgirl who mostly just gets drunk with a best friend and puts on old routines, and they get their heroin through a toy store owner named Santa Claus. It's just really not anything to take all that seriously. I mean, so, so there's this, this main couple that rents out a room, and I, I guess we're supposed to care for them like they're the protagonists, but after just their first few lines of dialogue, you, you just can't take any of this seriously. Oh, this place looks so awful. But darling, the last place we looked at cost ten pound a week. At least here it must be cheaper. Peter, I am so tired. We've been looking around all day. Let's just go in. <coughs> right, That's not to say that you can't have fun with this one. I mean, I do. I, I mostly appreciate it just for being this filthy, grimy piece of exploitation history. A lot of the charm comes from this movie being somewhat shrouded in mystery. You know, with people originally only seeing this through shabby VHS tapes, with little being known about the, the cast and crew. It's, it's just one of those titles that probably works better on paper. You know, like to hear rumors about, like, like whoa, someone's cousin found this obscure movie and it's supposedly like, like super messed up. Because, well, th this was my second time viewing it and it's honestly not that bad. As in, it's, it's not all that disturbing. Sure, if <laughs> if you show this to someone that's never seen any 70s exploitation, they'll undoubtedly ask you what the fuck's wrong with you. But if you're somewhat seasoned, you've seen worse. The thing is, those movies weren't called The Sinful Dwarf. It's, it's, it's kind of like how everyone thinks of the original The Texas Chainsaw Massacre as this super gory horror flick, despite there being barely any on-screen violence. Sure, <laughs> this one is a little more out there, specifically when it comes to sexual violence. Just don't expect this to be like the holy grail of 70s exploitation. Still, if you're into this type of cinema, it's very much worth a watch. Yeah. Uh, a little while back I did this uh, Disturbing Movies uh, part, it was part 22 to be exact, in which I covered like a bunch of these, these disturbing um, exploitation classics from the 70s. I'm not quite sure why I didn't talk about this movie back then, but I, I, I don't know, I, I'm just glad that I got to it eventually. Even though it, it might not be as out there as its title and reputation suggests, it, it's still a, uh, a nice little uh, curiosity. Speaking of um, curiosities, well, let's move on to Australia, might to take a look at our next movie. Oh no, it's uh, Cat Sick Blues. I I, I I remember, I think when this movie just came out, it, it like it piqued my interest, but I was never able to find a, a copy. Ever since I've I've, I've seen it twice now, and um, oh, oh wait, I, I mean, oh, oh let's oh, let's take a look at that the movie. Uh, I, I don't know about this one, guys. It's, but, but, I mean, let's just talk about it. That's that's what we do here in these videos. The movie starts with two girls watching cat videos on YouTube. Feels very 2007-ish. Oh, and yeah, there's also a guy outside dressed up as a cat who kills them. And well, looks like we get some pretty cool practical gore effects here. We are then introduced to our main character, Claire, who has a cat, Imelda, who happens to be an internet sensation. She also has a stalker, though, this mentally disabled guy, who at some point accidentally kills her cat. <laughs> it's so messed up, but also weirdly funny. He then proceeds to rape Claire, which is not as funny and mostly just messed up. Especially with it being caught on camera, which finds its way onto the internet, with people making reaction videos to the clip. 
what the fuck is up with that? I mean, in order to react to an actual rape video, you'd have to be a complete- Hey, it's Tanner from Unboxed, Watched, and Reviewed. Well, isn't that a pleasant surprise? Anyway, Claire joins a support group for people who lost a pet, and it is here where we meet Ted, the guy in the cat mask from earlier. He lost his cat as well, but unlike Claire, who is just trying to get through the trauma of losing her cat and being raped, Ted over here is trying to bring back his cat by killing nine people and saving their blood or something. He also has custom-made cat claws and a strap-on cat penis? I guess I do not know what a cat penis looks like. I, I also have no idea if I can show this. So yeah, and these two, for some reason, go out on a date? Maybe it was the way he reacted to her opening up about her rape experience that charmed her. So yeah, this just oozes chemistry, doesn't it? And well, a bunch more stuff happens, but my biggest problem is that it's all so uneven. Some of it is kind of silly, like when he goes to this dubstep party. It turns into a sort of like kick-ass gory horror flick when he kills these backpackers in a hostel. But it also has some genuinely creepy sort of like dream sequences. And other murder scenes are just straight up mean-spirited and vile. And don't get me wrong, I don't have a problem with any of these styles. It's just so weird to see them all being incorporated in the same movie. I mean, <laughs> on the one hand you have a man dressing up as a cat killing people in order to bring back his feline friend, which is such a silly over-the-top premise that you'd expect it to be like a, a dark comedy. Which it is, at times. Because the other half of the story is about a girl trying to deal with her trauma of being raped. And it's kind of hard to make that funny. So, yeah, I don't know, it's, it's cat sick blues. Like I said, I've, I've seen it twice now and I, I just can't seem to make up my mind. I mean, I, I think I like it, but I just keep finding myself coming back to just like, like how uneven this feels. I purposely didn't give away uh, the ending, like, like all of the movie, because I, I'm pretty sure I intrigued at least some of you guys that are watching this that they have not seen this one yet. And you know, I, I do want there to be some surprises for you left. So yeah, in the end, in, in all honesty, um, yeah, check it out. I mean, what, what's the worst that can happen? And then um, in the meantime, let's take a look at uh, the last movie in today's video. What was the, uh, the destination again? Ah, that's right, South Korea. Ah, oh, man, like so much good stuff to, to pick from. Uh, I went with uh, Bedeviled. And uh, yeah, man, I, I don't really have anything clever to add to that. So let's just take a look at the movie. Yeah, that was, that's, that's just some pretty good stuff, honestly. Yes. We start things off in Seoul. Here we have big city corporate lady Hei Won. She is not very nice, which results in her taking a forced break from work. She then decides to use this time to visit her estranged childhood friend Bok Nam, who lives on a small remote island with her husband and daughter. Upon arrival, she's warmly welcomed by her friend, but soon realizes she got herself into quite a different little world. And that brings us to the obvious theme of the movie, which is basically like progressive big city mainland life versus the more conservative indigenous small island life. Although it might not per se be a theme in the sense that I'm not sure if the director was trying to make a point by pointing this out, as at the end of the day, it is really mostly just a, a revenge thriller drama type of deal. It's just, it is a big part of the story. The elderly women at the island, they're all like, ah, women, they, they should just serve their men. If they want to bang some young prostitutes, you just go along with it. And Hey Won, who's initially somewhat reluctant to reconnect, she's all like, yeah, that's not how we do it back in the big city. Basically, throughout the movie and inside the story throughout her whole life, Boknam's patience is just being tested and tested until she finally snaps, and that's when we get to the revenge part. But first, we need to talk about expectations, because I've seen quite some reviews of people making that mistake, you know, going in with the wrong expectations. Don't think of this as a balls to the walls gory revenge flick. I mean, there's elements of that in here, for sure, and it does get gory at some point, but 
if that's all you're going in for, you're going to have a miserable time during the first 75 minutes or so, as it starts out mostly as just a, a drama. And that's not a bad thing, if you know what to expect. Before I started working on this video, I rewatched the movie, it was now my second time seeing it, and I think I might have enjoyed it more this time, as I now kinda knew what to expect. I mean, I made the same mistake, I remembered the first hour taking forever, but now I thought it just flew by, and that it was actually good, and pivotal to the story. Definitely something to keep in mind. Still, perhaps it could've been a little shorter, but that's a different story. I think it's a great movie, and it does actually get quite disturbing, mostly in the way Booknam is treated. Not just by her husband, although he's an absolute scumbag, but sometimes it was the, the elderly women that annoyed me the most, really to an infuriating degree. Such bitches. And sure, the build up, if you will, the, the, the drama part, it might take a little long, which I honestly didn't really mind. But yeah, so just so you know, there is a payoff. We do get that satisfying, delicious revenge. S sort of. But that's for you to find out. Again though, just go in with the right expectations. Yeah. Oh man, I, I, I definitely recommend this one. It's it's, it's great. It's, it's a good one. It, honestly, it, it's times like this that I'm kind of happy that uh, Parasite won all those awards like last year. What? what uh, wasn't last year, nothing happened last year. Um, you know, they won all those awards because, you know, it, it brought some more attention to uh, Korean cinema and ever since like more people are like realizing like, oh, they, they actually make some great movies in Korea. And I'm like, yeah, no fucking shit. They've been doing that for the past 20 years or so. Anyway, yeah, this, this was a good one. And uh, well, well, that brings us to the end of today's video. Ah, what, wasn't that a bunch of fun? Let me know in the comments if you agree. You know, like maybe tell me like, oh, that, this was a bunch of fun. And uh, you know, leave a like, subscribe, turn on the notifications. Oh, I, I feel like I've, this is the first time I ask you guys this. Probably because I assume you, you guys already have them on, right? Huh? And then um, I'll, I'll see you guys in, in the next video. It's going to be part 30. That's cool. Um, cheers, guys. Have a nice day.